I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues? Or the stories that impact your life? Jim, who was on in the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Welcome to the talk. I'm Daisy McAndrew. Tonight, the Met Police urge pro Palestinian protesters urgently to reconsider marching on Armistice Weekend as the force comes under pressure to ban the demonstrations. A judge threatens to throw Donald Trump out of court during his civil fraud trial in New York. And eco yods just stop oil, invade the cenotaph, and smash a priceless painting all in a day's work. Joining me on the panel tonight are Penn Smith and JJ Anisiri, James Max and Esther Kraku. First off, though, let's get a quick news update from Zora Suleiman. Good evening. Well, drama's unfolded in a New York courtroom as Donald Trump defends himself in a major civil fraud lawsuit. The judge has already told the ex-president's lawyers to control their client after they became frustrated by his lengthy responses. While Trump's being questioned about the structure of his finances and the trust which holds his assets. He's accused of massively inflating the value of properties by over $2 billion in order to secure loans. If a pro-Palestine march goes ahead on Armistice Day, it would be obscene. That's from the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who's joined a growing number of people calling for the mass rally to be cancelled because of fears it could put war memorials at risk. Gaza's Hamas-controlled health ministry claims the number of people killed there since October the 7th has now passed 10,000. Meanwhile, Israel's military says it surrounded Gaza City and divided the besieged coastal strip into two, north and south, claiming to have hit 450 targets in the past day. Meantime, the director of Gaza City's largest hospital also says 200 people were killed in airstrikes overnight. The Prime Minister is vowing to stop strikers from derailing Christmas. Rishi Sunak has extended laws designed to provide a minimum level of cover during strikes to include rail workers, ambulance staff and border force employees. He says over Christmas people will now be able to travel to see their loved ones and get the emergency care that they need. And four men have been charged over the theft of an 18-carat gold toilet from Blenheim Palace. The fancy loo worth £4.8 million was nicked four years ago. It was part of an art installation there. The men, all in their 30s, will appear back in court later this month. The toilet's never been found. Well, that's the latest from Talk TV Newsroom. I'm Zora Suleiman. Zora, thank you very much. Now, first tonight, here on the talk, to fears that violence could erupt on the streets of London this weekend as police have asked pro-Palestinian protesters urgently to reconsider their march plan for Armistice Day. More than 70,000 demonstrators are expected to descend on the capital this Saturday, coinciding with veterans paying their respects to Britain's war dead at the Cenotaph. Writing to Sir Mark Rowley, Rishi Sunak insisted the force had the powers necessary to ensure the protest did not disrupt or disturb acts of remembrance. Well, the commissioner must first recommend a ban in order for ministers to block the march, but he's so far declined to do so, saying he's keeping the situation under constant review. Well, Home Secretary Suella Bravman, who described the protests as hate marches, has warned anyone planning on damaging the cenotaph will be jailed faster than their feet can hit the ground. But Scotland's First Minister, Hamza Youssef, whose in-laws recently escaped Gaza, believes the march should absolutely go ahead. The, the march that is taking place, I think, on this Saturday, so it's, of course, the day before uh, Remembrance Sunday, I understand it's taking place after uh, the minute's uh, silence that we will all undoubtedly observe. I hear it's not going anywhere near Whitehall or, indeed, the Cenotaph. And, of course, if armistice was about anything, my goodness, it's about peace. 
Well, while organisers of the march insist they won't go near the Whitehall Monument, veterans have voiced their disgust that a political demonstration has been organised on a weekend, supposedly for quiet reflection. And in an exclusive interview with Piers Morgan Uncensored this evening, the Israeli President Isaac Herzog says this. It's a atrocious and hypocritic, and I call upon all decent human beings to object to the march and ban it, because the symbol of that day is a symbol of victory, and it's, it's a symbol of doing good, because when you fight evil, sometimes you have to fight. You have to fight evil in order to uproot evil. I think the most interesting thing that's happened and that's just happened in the last um, few moments or so is this almost begging that's come out of the Metropolitan Police to the organisers of the march saying, please, can you reconsider? I mean, I think, well, I suspect that they're on a hiding to nothing. The Met is on a hiding to nothing. I'm sure the organisers probably won't say we will cancel the march. I do wonder whether people are not worrying unnecessarily because Remembrance Weekend, the armistice on Saturday and the, um, the Sunday Remembrance is a hugely important moment in our in our national calendar, and I think all of us around here would expect and hope and pray everybody to give it the uh, the, the respect and seriousness that it deserves. Having said that, the march isn't supposed to be going anywhere near Whitehall or the Cenotaph. It's going to you know, from Hyde Park down to Vauxhall, where the American embassy is, and it's starting a couple of hours after the, the 11 o'clock um, silence. So there's a bit of me that thinks this should be able to be handled by the Met Police, but in some ways, to me, they seem a bit weak today for saying, oh, go oh, on, go oh on, go can, on. can you yeah, just please. not bother this weekend because it's going to make our life a it's little not, bit difficult? And it's not going to happen, <clears> is it? Because the thing is that it's been, it's been agreed that it can go ahead you know, it, it's like it would be last minute if you suddenly said no. I mean, I think what people are worried about, though, is not that it's not going anywhere near the, the cenotaph. It's not going to go, you know, as you say, it's not going there. Well, that's if everybody agrees to do what they're supposed to be doing and actually is doing what uh, Yusuf Hamza says, which is, you know, a reflection. It's a weekend of reflection. And surely that the, the armistice was all about peace. Yes, it is. But the trouble is we've seen what we've seen with these marches is that there is also a vociferous minority who are anything. Uh, they are not about peace at all. They are chanting things, uh, as we know, which are um, anti um, Anti-Israel. Uh, anti Sorry, uh, thank you very much for filling that in. Anti-Israel. This this idea of for, you know from the river to the sea, um, and there was a, there was an interesting article in the Standard today uh, from a, a woman who was uh, saying that she just said perhaps you know what we should do or what they should do, the organisers should do, is call out anything which is absolutely anti-Semitic and, and hideous and actually call it out and say, oi, you, don't do that. You know, actually, actually weed out the people who are not doing it for the best of reasons and who are doing it, some of them, she's saying, of course, because they're angry at everything. They're angry at the West. They don't want to live anywhere else, but they're angry at the West. They're angry about uh, the, the Israelis. They're angry about so many other things that they're doing this. When we look at the footage on, on screen now of these protesters attacking the police and crashing with them. Mm. Proportionally, the amount of clashes the police are having with protesters on these marches, it's the equivalent if you're taking a Premier League football match where there's 70,000 people and you're getting five or six arrests at each game from hooligans. Mm. We wouldn't turn to football matches and then say, all football fans are now banned from every stadium because of this small yeah. amount of people are doing it. These guys who are causing the issues, they're out there looking for a fight. Yeah. And unfortunately, people like the English Defence League and these far-right extremists are going down this weekend looking for a fight. Yeah. I don't think either of those sides really care about the causes. I think they're looking for, yeah. for that clash. And I remember when Black Lives Matter were having their, their protests and their, their marches, there was one day when, again, these far right groups had said, we're going to go down there and we're going to have a fight. So Black Lives Matter cancelled cancelled for that day so it's to avoid the clash. And I think in this case, we should probably actually say to them, leave it this week. We but I think that if you have a look at um, Armistice Day and... I, what it, and th this is why I feel uneasy about having anything banned. That even though I frankly mm -hmm. disagree with pretty much everything that people are asking for on the march, on the basis that a ceasefire means that you have to have two sides who are prepared to engage in that, and you don't have that. 
And also, you have a lot of people there, and whether it's a vociferous minority or otherwise, who are chanting things which are seriously anti-Semitic, and it needs to be quelled. However, and against the law. And you, against you the law. You must point that, you know, it, it, it's important it, to point that out. The police have the powers. It is. Mm. But having said that, the reason that we have Armistice Day is partly because this country fought for freedom of speech. We fought to have the right to be able to protest. We fought to have the right where people can have freedom of speech, can say their piece, in the knowledge that we have a civil society that hopefully allows sensible debate about these things. So that's why I'm hesitant about banning it. But I also think that... I just wish that people, and I know that they won't, but I just wish people would do a little bit more homework about why calling for a ceasefire is in itself anti-Semitic and why when you start to have a look, it's a lovely idea, by the way, but it, you can't deal with a group who doesn't recognise you and wants to kill you all. Why, 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 oh, why? Yeah, I was just about to say, I, I, I think it's really deeply regrettable and tragic that people that care about the plight of the Palestinians, which I think any decent person does, they have been reduced by this, you know, my minority of very mentally unwell and actually quite malicious people. Because I don't think that's the case. I don't think calling for a ceasefire is anti-Semitic. I think that's ridiculous. But at the end of the day, you're right. P the people that died in the First World War died so we have the freedom of expression. And I think it's regrettable. I hope they don't do this because I think they're tarnishing the whole sort of pro-Palestinian cause with this brush. But, you know, they have the right to do that. I, I do think that we should remember that other countries would not tolerate this. Armistice, if the Armistice Day was, you know, as significant in other countries, non-Western countries, no other country would tolerate this because it's such an affront to the values of those countries that they actually think no this is this is so deeply offensive that we cannot allow this to go ahead and also i think we have to remember look if we're going to curtail people's freedom of expression in this way we actually do ourselves ourselves a disservice i want to know the people that have the audacity to go and march on this on this day i want to know them because i don't want people with these kind of abhorrent views that can shout anti-semitic stuff not the majority by no yeah. stretch the minority i don't want them to be hidden i don't want to to have this false sense of uh, you know security that i'm living with people that share my values when in reality they're happy to shout anti-Semitic stuff in the this, this streets of our capital. I want them to be seen, I want them to be known, I want the prevent police program to, to keep tabs on these people so we know these kinds of individuals mm. in our midst. A couple of things to bring you um, up to speed on. So whilst we've been on air, the organisers of the march have declined um, the, the Metropolitan Police's request to, 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 to rethink and to cancel uh, the march, as you said. Uh, no surprise there. And just another couple of things I just wanted to point out to you. So um, a demonstrator who was filmed a couple of years ago, um, uh, admittedly, leading chants of from the river to the sea, and we all know what that mm. means. That means annihilating no Israel. Israel. Yeah. No Israel. Um, so this was at a pro-Palestinian march. Um, has turned out to be an advisor for the Metropolitan Police. There is no justice! justice. 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 There is no justice. Justice. There is no justice. Justice. From the river to the sea. From the river to the sea. So you could clearly hear him saying, from the river to the sea there. Um, so that's Atik Malik. He's a solicitor. He's also railed against global censorship by the Zionists, quote unquote, um, was present in the police operations room during protests last month. So although that clip is a couple of years old, his involvement is very, very current. Um, and now, of course, you know, that, that will seriously embarrass the Metropolitan Police. But they did seem to be rather slow off the but mark, But it will James. also really worry the Jewish community because, mm. you know, people, yes. Jewish people up and down this country are genuinely concerned about their welfare. We've seen a 500% increase in anti-Semitic attacks. We've seen significant attacks in Western nations also. And uh, I don't think that people quite understand what anti-Semitism is and how it manifests itself and this element that, of foreboding that we've seen it all before. And I think there is genuinely yes. a concern. And that's where we look to the police and politicians to reassure and to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And the problem is that we're seeing a whole range of things that, yes, we must be tolerant, we must be this, we must be that, without people actually realising the offence that they're causing. And it, uh, sorry, I was just going to say, it was interesting. I don't know if you read uh, Giles Corrin in the, I think it was the Sunday Times the other day, and he was talking about how he went for a walk with his wife. Mm. And he said, you know, they were looking back uh, particularly at his family, who'd been uh, essentially they'd had to escape pogroms um, and, and twice, 
and, and how the whole thing about uh, the, the Jews had been, you know, we need to have portable um, careers so that we can, you know, if we need to move again quickly, we can go and find a job somewhere else, which is why so many of them, for example, are doctors and, uh, and lawyers and that sort of thing. And he was saying they were genuinely having a conversation. Where do we want to go? Where, where would we go? Where are we going to go if this becomes insupportable? I mean, nobody should be having those conversations yeah. about, having to, about thinking that they ought and to be And they're not the because, only ones. Yeah. That conversation no. is going on around in, within, the, mm. within the community. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly this weekend um, will be a tense time. We're going to move on now. And coming up, control your client. The judge in Donald Trump's civil fraud trial chastises the former president shouting, this is not a political rally, this is a courtroom. We've got the latest on that coming up next from New York on the tour. Now, Donald Trump has been warned to avoid political speeches and just answer the questions while giving evidence in his explosive $250 million fraud trial. In one extraordinary tense moment, the judge even threatened to remove the White House hopeful from court, asking his legal team to control their client. Speaking outside the courthouse, Trump repeated his claim that the charges against him were politically motivated. It's uh, political warfare, as you would call it, or political lawfare. Another name. That got a lot of names for it. But usually it takes place in third world countries and banana republics. Uh, nobody's ever seen that. To this extent, we've never seen it here. Uh, but we will go along and 
we will hopefully uh, do very well in every regard. We'll win the election and we'll make America great again. Well, the lawsuit was brought by the New York Attorney General, Letitia James, accusing Trump and some of his executives, including sons Donald Jr. and Eric, of fraudulently inflating the value of properties to secure better loans from banks. Trump has already clashed with the judge overseeing the case. Arthur N. Gurren ruled in September that Trump had committed fraud for years. The former president is relying on the same defence as his sons, shifting the blame onto company accountants, as well as arguing his properties were actually undervalued, not overvalued. I mean, it's sort of same old, same old, isn't it? Yeah. But you, in many ways, you can't really afford to say it's just Donald Trump being Donald Trump, talking about kangaroo courts and third world countries and banana republics and all whatever on earth uh, he was saying. I, I do worry about him saying, you know, the black attorney general is a racist. I, I worry that that has, that has got quite serious connotations in, in the way that he's putting this forward. But then again, we all know it's not going to make a dime of difference. His popularity is increasing the more trouble he gets into with the courts. Can I just throw something into the mix here, though? That on one hand, um, I, I don't really like the way that Donald Trump behaves and what he says outside and all that sort of business. And it, it's, you know, it's showboating. That having been said, and I'm not a Donald Trump apologist here, he is not responsible for the valuations of his properties. When a bank is lending money, he can say whatever he likes. As a bank, as a lending institution, you should be, regardless of who, you, who you're lending to, you should be having proper third party independently verified valuations, worked in banking, All right, everybody else has it. We are going to um, cross straight over to New York where Trump's attorney Alina Habert is talking. Something when they see something wrong. But I was told to sit down today. I was yelled at and I've had a judge who is unhinged slamming a table. Let me be very clear, I don't tolerate that in my life. I'm not going to tolerate it here. And you know what? You shouldn't either. Because not every American citizen gets a camera and a microphone. And what I'm seeing is such a demise of American judicial system and democracy. Miss James came out this morning and said that she knew Mr. Trump. And she always calls him Mr. Trump because it kills her that he was the president. But the 45th president of this country, one of the best presidents we've had, has built a great company. It's worth a ton more than that statement of financial condition. And she doesn't know how to get out of it because her politics won't allow her. She calls him a bully. She says he's going to bring out racial slurs. He's going to say things today and taunt her. Well, Miss James, you taunted him. Before you came into office, before you saw one record, one statement of financial condition, you taunted him. You said his administration was too male and too pale. Those are her words. She said that she and Michael Cohen were going to be his biggest nightmare. Where well, I have some news for you, Miss James. Michael Cohen folded, lied, and crumbled. Your star witness, along with all the DAs and corrupt AGs, need to be paying attention to what happens when you let us take the stand, when you let my client speak the truth and the judge can tell me to sit down and he can try and shorten my client's testimony but it is loud and clear they've got nothing they've got nothing but their politics she's got nothing but her soros backing which we discovered recently and i am sick and tired of seeing it pay attention america pay attention because when you're in court one of these days and you don't have a lawyer that has a microphone and you don't have a lawyer that can go on TV and you've got judges gagging them, what are you going to do? We need to fix this country and we need to stop what is happening in this courtroom. President Trump is worth a lot more and she wasn't ready for it. She doesn't understand it. And before she rushed to judgment, she should have thought about attacking somebody with over 50 years of real estate expertise who changed single-handedly the skyline of New York City. She picked the wrong person, and her politics will fail for it. Are you concerned by the judge's statement that um, President Trump's longer answers, that he draws negative inferences from 
So right. let's be clear well, about why. That is Alina Haber, um, Trump's attorney. I mean, that was quite an extraordinary <laughs> outburst. <laughs> mm. She's, I mean, yeah, you'd want great. her in your corner. She's great. Well, yeah, of course. Mm. But I mean, look, look, the thing is, and I have to say, like James, I'm not here to defend Trump, but it's really hard to make the case that this is not a witch hunt because this is a civil case that's been brought before him. You're right. If you, if banks are going to lend you money, they have to get the value of, of the, the asset that they're trying to lend you money against, you know, independently evaluated. That's not necessarily, that's not Trump's fault. Like he doesn't, he doesn't carry do out this, Trump. Exactly. He doesn't carry out this process. And at the end of the day, the fact that all of these lawsuits are coming at the relatively the same time, you know, months before a general election, where it's clear that keeping him in the headlines is also actually boosting his ratings amongst Republicans, basically guaranteeing him the nomination, and then he is likely to face Joe Biden, who, unless he keels over, will be the nom will keep being the, nom uh, the nominee for the Democrats. And then independents are going to come out like they did at the last general elections and vote, you know, he's going to lose an even bigger um, sort of majority, right? This is clearly but isn't that, a, this is Sorry a clear to interrupt, plan. Esther, but isn't that, isn't that what they've said before? Is that this is kind of a double bluff? This is this is actually not anti-Trump. It's anti-Trump getting to be president well, yeah, again. In other words, yeah, exactly. But, but the, the most recent poll shows that in the uh, in, out of six of the big battlegrounds, mm -hmm. he out of in five mm -hmm. of those are now in favour of Trump. And you say that he says this woman is a racist. His vote is going up amongst the black people in America and Latinos. So he is very very popular. He's not he, amongst the independents. Not the, the only independents, ones that yes, count. Fine, but, but, the well, only but ones, listen, they are the only ones. Esther, that I'm still count. talking, please, okay. please. <laughs> but um, as you say, and he had a deposition earlier this year, and he said exactly what you two were saying that it's not, it's not down to me, it's down Ooh. to the banks to say how much my stuff's yeah, worth. I can tell them anything. But he's kind of right. He has this thing called the Mona Lisa Project. So he says he bought Mar a Lago estate for 18 million. He says it's worth over a billion now. And the banks will say, no, it's not. And he'll say, well, actually, Saudi Arabia would, would give me a billion for it. And it's kind of right. If you own the Mona Lisa, it's up to you how much you sell it for. And people can give you the valuation, but it's the seller who has the control. But also, price is different from value. So sometimes yeah. price and value will coalesce, and sometimes they will be different. And that's why this, when you start to have a look at the, the cases, I mean, I didn't particularly like, like what his lawyer said. I kind of like the fact that, mm. I mean, she's, she's, you know, she's a fully paid up member. Um, but where she was right is to say, look, you're going after the wrong guy here in the wrong way. These, these, when you start to have a look at what they're actually going for him for, it is not fraudulent to say that your property is worth more because you may have had conversations with a buyer who might want it because but, of because of you. But also, if I thought it was very interesting, and again, it will land well. The content of what she was saying, the uh, you know, Letitia James is backed by George Soros. That is the type yeah. of comment that will not go down well with a lot of Americans who feel very disenfranchised by the, as, as Trump would call it, you know, the swamp, the Washington swamp that's all backed by these small minority of billionaires who are pulling the levers on power. You know, that, that will go down well. Mm. And also when she was saying most defendants in trials don't have cameras and microphones, they, you know, it's happening in secret. She was implying that the judicial judiciary is rotten and corrupt and that she had been a victim of this judge shouting and screaming at her. But, she, playbook, but she made it very cleverly about the average man or woman who yeah. might find themselves in court and how you know, they would find themselves at the, the whim yeah. and mercy I, of an unpleasant judge. It was clever. Yeah, I also think that even if you know, it was proved that, you know, he shouldn't have done it and ex exaggerated Mara Lago by 2,300% or whatever. The point is, it comes back to that, uh, to that Leona Hemsley. Do you remember when mm -hmm. Helmsley, when she said, uh, 1989, I think it was, when the she hotelier. got done for, for, for the hotelier for tax fraud and she got done. And she, you know, and the whole point she was, it was that she said, uh, only little people pay taxes. And the thing is, whilst a lot of people were going, oh, that's awful, there were many other people who thought, well, everybody tries to avoid yeah, paying. Smart. Paying to, and, and they will look at that and go, smart, clever, yeah. intelligent. You know, it's, it, mm. it's a, it's a, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Yeah. It's just being a kind of the cleverest shark in the sea. Exactly. It's Trump being a good businessman. And yeah. another thing said in the deposition in April is that this judge is going after Trump. He's not cleaning up New York. If he takes out Trump, thousands of jobs are going to be gone. Mm. All the construction contracts that Trump has across that city. It's the poor people, it's the workers, it's the labourers who are going to suffer. Meanwhile, crime in New York is through the roof yeah. and the judge, instead of going after proper criminals, they're going after Donald mm. Trump because they don't like him because he's president and he's a, he's a Republican. That is it. This is clearly political and unfortunately, it's helping Trump. And yeah. I'm, I'm, on, this, on this occasion, I'm team Trump.
just because I think and this is a political witch hunt. People, people are just losing faith in the political system more yes, and more I agree. because of this. And this is the thing. You're dedicating you know, financial re and judicial resources to this witch hunt. Mm. I mean, why? Why is this necessary? Why waste I, I do that think time? it's a fun fact, though. So <laughs> Trump has been abusing the judge's law clerk on social media, and the judge actually had to tell him to stop doing that. So Trump is taking this so personally that he's abusing a law clerk who's basically in the yeah. background of this case. Just taking down That's, That is business. how heated he yeah. is about this. And well, he denied moment. it was the clerk. He said he was talking about someone else, not the clerk. But he, now he's been gagged and can't yeah. speak at, at all. <laughs> I mean, I suppose just for most of us, just the, the, the political nature of the law in the States is so alien to, yeah. to, to how we're used to. So seeing that attorney talking in that way was, was quite a sight. Anyway, coming up, Just Stop Oil activists target the Cenotaph and smashed a priceless painting, all while begging for more cash to continue their protests. That's next here on The Talk. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. <laughs> do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? <laughs> I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous... What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis Sanz? No, I am Sanz. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's That's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> that's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after this <laughs> film. <laughs> Get right. uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, yeah. <laughs> Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yes. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going. To, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to The Talk. Just Stop Oil activists have been accused of shamelessly targeting the Cenotaph just days before Remembrance Sunday. According to eyewitnesses, the eco-zealots laid themselves down on the ground in front of the war memorial before police swooped in and arrested them. The protesters have since insisted they didn't intentionally target the Cenotaph, claiming they were moved there after blocking traffic in Whitehall. Meanwhile, in another biz, uh, bid to grab headlines, two activists smashed the glass covering the classical painting, The Rockaby Venus, which hangs in the National Gallery. 
protesting against the government's decision to award new oil and gas licenses, the pair highlighted how the painting had previously been targeted by the suffragettes in 1914. But as the stunts become increasingly more desperate, there are signs their supporters are starting to back out. The eco-mob is now cap in hand, begging the public for donations so they can continue disrupting, well, us, the public. Now, I don't think uh, today's actions will have us reaching into our pockets. Uh, but as we are you think sure of, about that? Uh, mm, fairly certain. <laughs> uh, I, I guess if one looks at the gallery where they've tried to put themselves together with the suffragettes, I actually think that's pretty insulting because there's a massive mm. difference. And the massive difference is that the suffragettes did not have the vote. They did not have the ability to work within... Um, a democracy to say, here's the plan, here's the idea, here's what we're worried about, we're going to put ourselves up to election because we genuinely think we need change and then bringing everybody with them. What they're doing is they're disrupting, saying, look, these great people, they did these wonderful things and we're just like them and it's copycat except that big missing point. <laughs> and then when you're talking about disrupting the public and all this other stuff that's going on and they're, you know, targeting the Senate off saying, well, if they're stupid enough to not even know what the Senate off is, I mean, frankly... <laughs> to, to coin Mr Collins, in the bin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's quite interesting, isn't it? I, I found a few facts and figures which I thought were quite interesting. 23,500 officer shifts used up by them since April. thought that was interesting when we're constantly talking about how long it takes, for example, to get to emergencies, to burglaries, to various other sort of... Uh, to various other things. Um, and also, here's an interesting thing. Well, I found it interesting because I was thinking they're going to have to get there, those police officers. I'm assuming they don't go by tube, therefore they'll be having to go by patrol car, powered by petrol. And I thought, let me just check. Well, they've got 41 Nissan Leafs, or leaves, if you're talking about plural. Um, and also, here's another thing. According to the website, I know, I just found that interesting. According to, the, uh, to, to Just Stop All's website, most of the money comes from the Climate Emergency Fund, which is a US network set up uh, a few years ago to fund climate activism, part funded by the US philanthropist Aileen Getty, the granddaughter mm -hmm. of petroleum mm, tycoon yeah. Paul Getty. Now, if I, I don't know about you, but if I had a load of money that was kind of, you know, came to me through something like petrol and I kind of wanted to say, let's just get rid of this and let's try and do something else, wouldn't you think it'd be better to fund some kind of bursary or something or some kind of college instead of to try and, unwell, instead of, middle class instead of trying to do something like this and actually go, let us find a way of harnessing, for example, in Britain, the power of waves and actually being able to store it because that after all is most of the problem in with, with a lot yeah. of uh, renewables and everything why not do it that way rather than really annoying people i think there's a bit of an overreaction to this they didn't smash the paint they just sm uh, shattered a bit of the glass that was the case that's protecting it they're a bit of a nuisance and they're very annoying but mm. they're not no one's really paying them any attention you know I what I mean? The like they're, they're not doing why, too much harm. If they if they if they can get away with not behaving civilized, then why should we behave civilized? Clearly, there's there's a two tier system here. If I can go out and do that, then why should you be be able to behave like a normal adult in society? I think that's the main point. And they're just petulant brats. We're not going to get rid of oil. I'm sorry. So certainly, China isn't. India isn't. You know, this is how and rapid industrialization happened. We use fossil fuels because they're cheap, because they're plentiful, and because they're reliable. And if they really want us to just stop oil, then they should put their minds to actually finding us an option. Mm. You know alternative that is also cheap, plentiful and reliable. It's really that simple. Uh, moving on now, Rishi Sunak is under mounting pressure to investigate bombshell claims that his party covered up alleged rapes by a Tory MP. The Prime Minister has called the allegations very serious but insisted that Conservatives have a robust complaints process. His comments come as senior figures on all sides of Westminster call for an urgent inquiry into claims the party sat on the sexual assault claims for years. The Deputy Prime Minister... Oliver Dowden denied such a cover-up took place, but acknowledged the party may have secretly funded an alleged victim's medical treatment. Now, the devastating accusations are alluded to in Nadine Doris's explosive new book, while it's been revealed that Tory chairman Jake Berry and former chief whip Wendy Morton reportedly wrote to the police last year, urging them to investigate. I'm sorry, I just read this, and first of all, as I was reading it, I was thinking, what? And then again, what? Mm. Uh, um, I mean, so many of those statements, you just think, what, why 
Uh, why was it not dealt with at the time? Why is this? Why does it have to be written in a book? Why are we only just now You're finding out this though. about? I mean, but, this is the thing. This is a woman. I'm sorry. If Nadine Dorries had 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 gotten her damehood like she wanted, she wouldn't be writing any of this. She wouldn't be happily tarnishing the party. That would have given her, mm, you know, her damehood. Period. Well, to be honest, period. And then, yes, and exactly. not just a damehood. Period. Exactly. Period. And the second question is, if she knew this and she's happy to put this in a tantalizing book, why didn't she say it when she first knew about it? So clearly, she's not the person acting in good faith here. And also, we know that sexual assault allegations can be more damning than the actual, you know, sexual assault, with all due respect. This is why Rishi Sunak is completely right. This is a matter for the police. Because at the end of the day... She it can... should have been a matter for the police it, it, it surely still, before. It still is. But this is the thing. I, we, I don't want to live in a society and in a culture that the second you hear sexual assault allegations, everyone mm. you know, gets their backs up like cats and say, oh, they're guilty or they're, they're guilty of foul play, <laughs> whether it's for men or for women or whoever. So I just think, you know, we need to treat this like like what it is, a scorned woman who is happy to throw no, the party. She I was don't think, for decades I don't think, under the bus. I don't the think bus. it's fair to say it's a scorned woman. The fact is, we have the former Tory chairman, Jake Berry, and the chief whip, mm -hmm. who both contacted the police before this book came out, right? So Nadine, what she, it, it's, only, it's only now being properly spoken about, and now she's not being addressed with it because of Nadine's book. So whether, whatever the reason for her writing that book, the fact is, it's, it's a good outcome, and this will now be investigated. That's the most mm. important thing. However, if these two uh, MPs knew about it and Nadine also knew about it, clearly the wider um, wider part of Westminster knew and no one else was acting apart the from these two MPs. Two MPs went to the but police and urged but, them to investigate. So it's not like they didn't do anything about it. Yeah, but it. this is the problem within politics, that for too long the political system hasn't felt that it has had to move with the times in the way that we deal with either sexual assaults or indeed conduct, uh, bullying, uh, a whole problem yeah. within political culture. Yeah. So this is a wake-up call. You can no longer bury things as a political party. I don't care whether you're left, right or whoever you are. All our political parties have got problems right at the top, right within their elected core of people who are behaving in a way that is no longer acceptable in our society. And they appear not to when the whistle is blown. They seem to brush it under the carpet but you and see, couldn't possibly. You see, the sentence that, that, that shocked me was Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden denying the cover-up, obviously, but acknowledged the party may have secretly funded an alleged victim's medical may, treatment. May. The thing is, he said he wasn't sure, because I saw that interview. He he didn't want to outright deny it in case it, it turned out to, to be, be true. My my suspicion is who it's coming from as opposed to this happening, because I do acknowledge this can happen in any party. How many MPs and do you have currently? Um, an investigation? Well, no, an oh, investigation. sorry. <laughs> an investigation. All of them. Good Lord. All of them know. 50-ish, no, no, no. exactly. Yes. Statistically, uh, statistically, is crazy. Yes. Exactly. Huge and, um, and we, and, we, and we just had Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, who promoted a known sex pest after being told oh, yeah. this guy pinch is pinch by name, pinch by nature. No. no, 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 promote him. I'm not surprised by this happening in Westminster. Of course not. Yeah, I mean, look, and I'm... we want we want Westminster yeah. to be cleaned up. However, we must move on. Coming up, a controversial new book about the royal family claims the king is unpopular and the Prince of Wales is a power-hungry heir. Ooh. It's written by mm, Harry and Meghan's mouthpiece. So are the Sussexes pulling the strings? That's next on The Talk.
Welcome back to The Talk. The description for an explosive new book by Sussex mouthpiece Ogun Scobie has branded the king as unpopular and the Prince of Wales as a power-hungry heir. The controversial author also alleges Queen Camilla is willing to go to dangerous lengths to preserve her image, and Prince Harry was forced to start a new life after being betrayed. Mm. The attacks feature in advertising material for Endgame, Inside the Royal Family, and the monarchy's fight for survival, which is reportedly filled with a slew of damaging accusations about the royal family. It comes as Prince Harry has reportedly snubbed his father's 75th birthday celebrations next week in London. And it's the second time Harry has apparently turned down the chance to spend time with Charles after declining the King's um, offer to join him at Balmoral on the anniversary of the late Queen's death. First of all, I think Harry not attending his father's 75th birthday is not a surprise. It's a bit of a snooze fest. Um, he wasn't expected <laughs> to be there anyway. And good riddance. I think Omid Scobie's claim that <laughs> the King is actually quite unpopular. So the most recent polling shows the King's um, public approval rating is about 60%. Yeah. Most politicians don't get that at, through the entirety of their time, time in mm, office. True. I mean, we know we've had governments that have been elected based on basically 30% of the popular vote. <laughs> so to get a 60% approval rating is the dream for most people. And all of these accusations sound like exactly the kind of things you hear from the Sussexes. Who is talking to Omid Scobie? It's not like he has friends at Buckingham Palace. Everything he said, from what we're hearing, is like regurgitated from the Sussex camp. And I'm just thinking, okay, first of all, you don't have any friends there. So I, I'm really curious where you're getting this information from. I, I don't know where he got his claims about Prince William as well being um, power hungry. I think that may have something to do with Prince Harry's book about, you know, Africa is mine when well, Harry also, wanted to why would you about be, Africa. If, if you're born into going to get the top job, yeah. Why would you even be, be power hungry? hungry. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I find that astonishing. It's, a, it's almost as if he doesn't understand the system that he's, he's talking about. Yeah. But then also, it's so clearly this sort of drip-fed narrative that I think we've now learnt to see it for what it is. And I totally understand why Harry isn't turning up at his father's mm. do. They clearly haven't repaired their relations. It shows, however, that the king is prepared to offer the olive branch to say, look, whatever you're invited. Because yeah. I think a lot of parents, frankly, treated like that, you wouldn't invite them. So well done on oh. the king for inviting them. Oh, I don't. <clears throat> but then also, I think that Harry is just feeding, or whether it's Harry, Meghan, his people, I don't know, just feeding this list of diatribe. Oh, Miss Scobie, get back in your box. Stop taking the dirty cash well, that you no. are just raking over with you your see, nasty, nasty, written, horrible stuff. Oh, do you know, you see, I don't know. I feel terribly sorry for... for I feel sorry for uh, King Charles because, actually, yes. you know, this is, is still his son and he loves him. And I just think they need couples counselling. I mean, they're all about <laughs> therapy. It's yes, some family they? therapy. It's a family therapy. I think yeah. it's... Because let's Harry face it, Harry therapy. loves a bit of therapy. We know he's very much that sort of West, that West California, that California mm. sort of slightly woo-woo stuff. Why not go and have... You know, just send a little email via via Scooby or whatever the name is, Scooby, 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 Scooby. Doo or whatever, <laughs> and just go and go. You know, Sorry. by the way, by the way, <laughs> by the way, can you can you get in touch? Can my people get in touch with his people? And let's try and sort out a little th bit of mediation. I think um, Harry and Meghan. They are friends with Ahmed Scobie. When he says that they're in, he's impartial and has been free, he's not. Mm. His mates, he's in their camp. And I think Harry and Meghan should be saying to him, stop. Yeah. Stop now. Yes. After they the, did the documentary on Netflix, yeah. they said, not going to do any more retrospective looks, not going to slag the family off anymore, but your friends are still doing it. If my friend, if you, Esther, if you wrote a book about my family, slagging off my family, I'd be saying to you, <laughs> please don't do this book. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Harry should absolutely yeah. intervene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think the bit of the book that everybody's so nervous about is there is a chapter, we know there's a chapter in the book on race and the royal family. So that will be the oh. bit that everybody will turn there. to first. He wasn't there, so I don't know where he's getting this from. Yeah, well, that that will <laughs> be the bit that will that that will certainly ruffle a lot of feathers. But right now, it is mm. time for small talk. Now, I've got the first one, which um, those of uh, of you who know me well know that I love sheep. I love pictures of sheep. I collect. Yes, I don't. I did. I guess I don't know you at all, then, no. Daisy. I thought you were going to say gin. I know you love gin. I do love gin. <laughs> I do love gin, and I love sheep. Anyway, so I was I was drawn to this story um, all last weekend. I'm sure you're aware about this. Is the sheep, the hairy sheep, that was hairy abandoned? Sheep. Well, that, that, oh. that's after the haircut. Um, this is the sheep that was called Britain's lowliest sheep, loneliest sheep, and she was um, stuck. Uh, on a sort of rock face. Anyway, she was winched out, but she's now being um, taken to a petting zoo. She's been all on her own for two years. She's been named Fiona. Does anyone know why she's been named Fiona? No. From Shrek? It is Fiona from Shrek. Really? Because there was a she famous Australian uh, sheep who was also christened the loneliest 
sheep ever, and he was called Shrek, so they've called her Fiona. Oh. But Animal Rice Rising activists, that's the organisation Animal Rising, they are very angry because she's being, she Fiona is being taken to a petting zoo and they don't think that she should be taken there. They think but that apparently she should she's be... not going to be taken there. No. Because they've reacted to it and yeah. they've said, mm, no, no, she's no, now in hiding. Yeah. <laughs> because oh, really? of the, the mm. potential. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Listen, I think we care more about the loneliness of sheep than pensioners. Uh, it sounds like... Um, <gasps> OK. Listen, I mean, it does. I mean, that's ridiculous. Like, I'm, I care more about the loneliness of old people than, yeah. you know, than lamb chops. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to start there. Right, Gen Z apparently are ditching uh, boozy pop songs. So a new study has found that songs about alcohol are vanishing from modern music as young fans shun drinking. It's probably because we're too broke. Um, but in the last five years, the numbers of uh, booze references references has plummeted by 79%. The study also highlighted that songs still referencing alcohol were less likely to glorify drinking and instead highlight the potential downsides. Uh, the study referenced Ed Sheeran's 2020, 2021 hit Bad Habits, in which he ends up alone after boozing. God, how worthy. How oh, boringly yeah. worthy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, probably... man who's obsessed with sheep and gin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's probably because they, they can't talk about the stuff that they probably are doing instead of the alcohol. Well, they could yeah. make songs about vaping, I suppose, but I don't think they would be very interesting. Yeah. I think it's because we're more of an isolated generation and there's nothing oh, sadder sure. oh, than, than, than being isolated yeah. and Put a sock in it. Oh, Gen Z, you're boring losers, the lot of you. Let's call them what they are. Gen Z. Gen Z losers. Losers. Yeah. I hate speech. Right. I like say, what have yeah. you got? So, um, Chelsea have been doing terribly in the league. I'm sure you're all aware. But Is that football? Yeah, it's football. <laughs> <laughs> but a poll has found that Chelsea fans are the best lovers in the Premier League. Oh, well, absolutely. More than one in ten women said a blue supporter had been their most memorable partner. Absolutely. Most memorable doesn't mean best, by the way. However, one at the other end, that, that means so nine in ten words. <laughs> at the other end of the table were Brentford fans, with just one percent of women asked being able to recall a passionate fling with a B supporter. Now, it may well be that Chelsea fans have taken a leaf out of their team's book trying to spend 70 to 90 minutes on top, <laughs> but still managing to finish second. <laughs> So they're not on the bottom, though. <laughs> I mean, listen. Oh, oh, oh very, very good, Penny. But doesn't this, <laughs> do, doesn't this research kind of uh, fail or succeed on finding women who've slept with lots of different, supporters, different supporters. teams of supporters, and not to admit I mean, to it? Yeah. To be able to make a comparison. I mean, I guess can you so. imagine admitting to like having slept with a Luton fan? <laughs> 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 Possible. I discovered a new football <laughs> oh, yes. club today on my Scala radio show. Oh, God, Sorry. with Luster. It was with Luster. played against Charlton Athletic and it was called the something like the Clay Pipe Song. Something like, doesn't even remember the name. Well, I, I, know, I don't, not that they look like the Pepper Mill <laughs> Clay Pipe or something uh -huh. and they put playing green and black. I think we've <laughs> gone off on a tangent. Yeah, yeah we have. A penny, let, a penny let me bring tangent. you back. <laughs> Nike have been criticised over something that some people say is unnecessary. £45 baby shoes. Nike has been blasted for making questionable and unnecessary £45 baby trainers. Look at those. I think they're quite nice, actually. They are yeah. Idiots. 45 um, quid? And they've been branded a very expensive pair of socks. Uh, the sports giant has released the Nike Swoosh 1 to give babies the crucial tools they need for natural development and to help prevent uh, foot issues in future. The shoe, which costs £44.95 and features soft fly-knit weave material on the upper rather than leather, and a flexible sole, the trainers have been met with a bafflement and contempt in equal measure on social media. I think I think this is a great idea. Why not? Get them in young. Yeah, because quite smart, babies quite nice. do walk. Treat your baby. Well, the thing, so the, the star of that shoe, you can see the bottom of it with the mould. Yes. Rubbery. Yeah, rubbery. That helps the babies with their development. With the, you see, that's feet nonsense. Growth. And also, by the way, yeah. £45 is not that expensive. Nike it, it, sell it, it, trainers for kids more expensive than that. Kids are unemployed. They're, they're, that is very expensive. Our parents, our parents didn't need those fancy shoes. No, they their, didn't. Feet, their feet didn't come out deformed. I'm not paying oh, £45. The, pounds yeah, the, the, these, these, yeah, are good, these are good for babies. What are they called? Clarks do a much cheaper version. By the way, can I just say Cray Valley Paper Mills? There we go. That's the. Point. I told oh, you. Oh, I goodness. told you it was Paper Mill something. Okay, thank you. <laughs> or did I say Pepper Mill? You pepper mill. <laughs> now I was very sad today oh, to read that in certain today. parts of the UK the appearance of the penny is coming to an end. <gasps> just go now. Oh, yeah, it's the out. end of Penny as we <laughs> know it. There's lots of people how, how saying exactly paid? the same. Uh, no, it's the Isle of Man is encouraging shops to round payments to the nearest 5p to help phase out 1 and 2p coins. Oh. And I tell you what, the good thing is that they found a majority of island residents after they uh, a penny plebiscite. <laughs> what a great name. <laughs> anyway, uh, they, they found that most residents were against scrapping the coin entirely. I'm all, of, I'm all for and all in support of getting rid of pennies. 
Absolutely. No. Yeah, pennies. How, how pennies. else do I pay you back with, with wow. English? Wow. <laughs> oh. I'm just penny saying. Penny machines that you get on the, you know, the end of the pier. You know? Yeah. Those pennies, are good ones, yeah. Penny you could push this Love penny it. off the pier if you want. Oh. <laughs> sorry, Penny. Oh, so sorry, wow. Penny. Wow. <laughs> Feisty. We need to keep coins in circulation. We need to use money, money more. But also, yeah, if we you do. take them away, tap, inflation. Tap, tap. Yeah. Terrible. Good point. It's bad for inflation. Well, if you start putting you up stop... prices because you take yes. away the ones and the twos oh. and then it becomes inflationary. Right. Because yeah. everything just goes up. We'll just put it how up. Can you do, how can you do £2.99 if you haven't got a 1p? That's yeah. right. You can't. Go back to 2p. Well, you've saved yourself. We're going to save Penny. Thanks. Okay. Save so the Penny. Penny's <laughs> end of peer show or something <laughs> like that. But we are coming up to the end of our show. But next up is Primetime with Rosanna Lockwood. Rosanna, what's on the show? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Daisy. Great seeing you guys at this time, by the way. I've really enjoyed it. Look, coming up on prime time, we're obviously going to give you the latest from inside Gaza, the latest on the military moves heading towards Gaza City. We're also going to be live from New York, speaking to a reporter who's been covering this latest fraud trial implicating Donald Trump, also speaking to one of his biographers and asking at the end of the show, are there too many golf courses in London and should we be building homes on them? Lots to keep you busy. Thank you so much. That is all we've got time for here on The Talk. I'm Daisy McAndrew. Many thanks to tonight's panellists. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Thank you to Penny, to JJ Anasiewicz, James Max and Esther Kraku. Back at six tomorrow. See you then. Bye-bye. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. <laughs> ah! Me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. Do you know what I love about Talk today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? <laughs> I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's, it's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter?